phenomenal to be back here and just to see how this campus has transformed, how the university has transformed. Right, it's been quite a journey. Do you remember when we first met? Oh yes, I remember that it was, we were in California at a conference called the Global Philanthropy Forum. I was way back in the audience and you were up there on the stage being interviewed and you were telling the story of Ashesi and how it started with your dream, how you left Microsoft, uh, how you encountered you know, different forms of higher education in Ghana and how you came to Barakuso and met with the chief, if I'm not mistaken, right. and elders, and, elders yeah. and told them about your dream. I mean, I was just so captivated by that story. I couldn't let the story go. I also remember that when you were done and you came off the stage, it's like a mob scene, you know, basically. Right, I mean, there's a lot of people around me all of a sudden. A lot of people around sudden. you, and I, said, I could barely, you know, get, I'm not that big a person, I just get myself through. And I could just barely hand you my business card and say, right. I'm Rita. I'm at the MasterCard Foundation. And then I had to back away because the crowd was too big. And I thought, oh, I, this guy's a rock star. That's what, that's what I remember. Yeah, so I, remembered, I remember that too. And, um, and then a year later, you called me. That's right. And you were in Accra. I, wa I was in Accra. And I just wondered if you remembered me and if there was any chance that we could have a meeting. Right. Of course, I remembered you, um, but I hadn't followed up for a year. Yeah, I thought it was a bit strange. Yeah. Why didn't you follow up? So, um, because I'd made a commitment to Jane Wales, huh. who was, uh, she ran the Global Philanthropy Forum. And when she invited me to this, she said, look, this is a forum that is a place for philanthropists to come and learn about what, what social entrepreneurs are doing, to help them in their thinking about their philanthropy. And it really needs to be a safe place for them, that there would be no solicitation, no fundraising. And so I had committed to Jane that we would not fundraise at the Global Philanthropy Forum. We, as Shesse, would not do so. And I kept that promise. I didn't solicit anyone. I didn't even reach out. And my team asked me about it, by the way. Um, there were people in my team who felt, but if they gave you their card, it's an invitation to reach out. <laughs> and I said, well, let's just hold off. Um, but I was really relieved when you, you called me. <laughs> I, I was no, really I, pleased. I was so happy that when you said that you would be willing to meet with me, uh, because I just wanted to learn and I wanted to hear more about the story. Right. Uh, and there's so much I wanted to learn about you and what this whole experience had meant. Uh, because I sensed right away from when you, when you were speaking at the Global Philanthropy Forum that this was going to be a journey, exciting, but right. tough yes, and challenging. Yeah. Tough and challenging. And I, what also captivated me was the story about the chief who asked you about the university and whether this would be a university just for Ghanaian students or for all Africans. And that spoke volumes about the wisdom of the chief. Right. And it also spoke volumes about the promise right. of what was to come. Right. And, and what you may not have known then was we were in the process of doing our second strategic plan. Mm -hmm. And in that plan, we had this uh, big goal of really doing a lot more with scholarships, really raising funds to get um, more people from the lowest economic strata across the continent to come to Ashesi. And at the time we had set that plan, it seemed like it'd be very difficult to do. Like, would, would we really be able to raise the funds? And I remember you asked me about what, what do the next 10 years look like? And I talked about we're going to do this, this, and that, and we want to really dramatically increase what we do with scholarships, and how you immediately said, hey, that's something we should look at. <laughs> and, and you talked to me about the Scholars Program and the, the connection with your team. Um, I was really struck by the conversation with your team mm. that they were not only concerned about numbers. 
they were concerned about individuals. They were concerned about people. They were really asking us what would be the best thing for your scholarship students. What are the difficulties that you're encountering in your current scholarship program? What are the things you wish you could do that you couldn't do? Um, and they also challenge us about things that we weren't doing yet that we should consider doing, right? So, for example, counseling. Mm -hmm. Really doing, having like a full-time counseling office and things like that. Um, so, they really did make us better and I was really struck by this foundation that was thinking about doing big things but was not losing sight of people. Patrick, thank you for saying that. But what you don't know is we were just a fledgling foundation, a fledgling foundation. And we, you know, like you, had big dreams, but knew we had to start somewhere. And, uh, and we were learning as we were going, learning, taking advice, uh, listening to many organizations who had gone before us on this whole scholarship education journey and told us, what they wish they had done. And so we were just taking lessons. And when we met, we were also looking to f start and start well uh, with organizations, with leaders who we felt that we could trust and we could walk this journey together and who would teach us and that the young people will teach us. And right away, we just felt from the engagement, the openness, the, the willingness to put difficult situations, difficult things on the table and right. ask, how do we solve them? Right. And what do we do? Right. You know, and where do we begin? And, and for me, that was always what cemented that this was going to be a really important partnership. I just don't real, I didn't realize at the time how life-changing it was, certainly for me mm -hmm. and for the foundation. Right. and for the Scholars Program. Yeah, and you talked about the Chief of Brekusu, and I remember I told you that when we first met them and we were negotiating for the land, uh, we had arrived for a meeting and he made us wait because the youth leaders were not present yet. That's right. And he said it's really important that the youth That's must right. be here because this is about their future, right? Mm -hmm. And you were really struck by that. Mm -hmm. You know, you you were like, you. I think your words were, wow, that's a lot of wisdom. Um, you and the foundation, your team, really emphasize young people a lot. Like, in all, whenever you're talking with us, it's really about the young people. You know, I, I think it's just by, it certainly was something organic. Mm -hmm. and, and when you start up, and despite having resources, you're beginning and so much about understanding what's the first step begins by listening right. and understanding. And we knew that we would be a foundation that would come to work here in Africa, that we would be a guest, that we needed to be responsive. And we, saw, we came because we saw of this huge demographic shifting and the, the magnitude of young people, young people who would be working, leading, doing, creating for the next 40 to 50 years. And we thought we need to get close and we need to understand. And so start by listening. Okay. As Shessie was one of the first partners in Africa. Yes. Um, why, why did you choose Ashesi as one of the first? Well, I have to say that um, your leadership it's a huge part of why we chose Ashesi, the vision. And one of the most powerful stories you told on that stage, and I'm sure I'm, not, I'm going to recount the order out of sequence, was the story about putting to the test, not just Ashesi and Ashesi's students, but also universities around, about having the first unproctored exam. Right. And the hullabaloo that it caused that you know, people didn't believe that university, a university an institution could run an exam where it wasn't supervised. Right. And you spoke about the honor code and taking young people through this journey 
and saying to them, when you're ready, when you're ready as a class to take this pledge of maintaining a standard, an ethical standard, then we're ready as well. That, I can't, I, that was mind-blowing, mind-blowing. And the fact that the Ghanaian private sector came out in support right. and said right away, this is the kind of university we need and these are the kind of students and this is the workforce that we want. That's that right. was a powerful story. Yeah. That was a powerful story. That was, that was a really uh, special moment for us when the honor system was challenged because, you know, yes, we did the we did the ethics conference and Ghanaian private sector were present to say this, what's happening at Ashesi is really important for our country. But internally within the university, we had received a directive that said, you've got to discontinue this thing or you might lose accreditation. And just the response of mm. the students, of course, but their parents, right? the parents were amazing because, you know, they're paying the fees, right? There's this risk um, f for them, and for, the, for, the, for their children and their wards. And I remember one, one mother who stood up and recited the Ghanaian national anthem to us. And the national anthem of Ghana is a prayer, right? It's, it's a prayer asking God to bless our country. Um, but one of the things that it asks for is that we have the courage um, you know, we, we have the courage to be honest, to really value honesty. Fearless honesty is, is what we talk about in our national anthem. And, and she said, if this is not fearless honesty, I don't know what is. <laughs> you, you, are, you are the one institution that is living up to the aspirations of our national anthem. And you, sh you should not stop, right? So anyway, I'm glad that that was one thing that, that really struck you that as well. I've never forgotten that. And that was directly influential when we began to, to we were still crafting the scholars program. Right. And as a result, we said, look, this is going to be an educational program. It's not a scholarship program. Right. The scholarship is just the vehicle. Right. This is going to be an educational program. It's going to be a leadership development program. But most importantly, it is going to produce, generate, support, nurture, ethical, transformative leaders. And that's been a mainstay of why the scholarship program or the scholars program, whatever anyone calls it, the MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program, needs to keep its promise about ethical leaders, transformative leaders. Right. So on that note, I'm just wondering, are there things that you would um, share with, that, with you know, African university presidents and vice chancellors, what are some of the things that you would hope that we all keep in mind moving forward? And I know you're working with a lot more African universities we are, these days. You know, the Ashesi was our first African higher education institute. Well, you were among the first in the, the cohort of partners to begin with in 2012. Uh, but today, more than 50% of our partners, our network, are African universities. And so, and that's just a, a moment of pride, but it's also a moment for us to ensure that we are listening, listening to them, listening to the aspirations of their institutions, where they are leading their institutions. And in turn, as we listen to them, I hope that they keep in mind you know, one, the huge ambition and the mission to be part of the transformation of this continent, transformation of the world, that we are entrusting to them the development and the care of young people. And, what, and even as they grow in numbers, and some of these universities are, are large institutions, that they think about the individual stories stories young people carry with them, the dreams that they have, and the role at this point in time of the, the university, of the institution, in that young person's life. They think about all the things that they could, they could do, should do, to enable this young person to start out life 
and put them on a trajectory. Not only, for sure they will be on a trajectory where they will change their own lives and their families, but a trajectory to really change people, the lives of others around them, their community. And just as exactly as what I see today with so many of the young people who have graduated from Ashesi, whether they are helping us monitor fair elections, save babies who are preemies, whether they are starting up other companies, you know, dreaming up devices and tests and, and different tools, or whether they're entering public service. That's what those vice chancellors need to think about. Right. You know, that they too have a hand in changing the future right. by listening to their young people. See, see the young people, see people, listen to them, listen care, to them, for, them, care for them, and through them care for society. Absolutely, yeah, because we live through, we, we extend ourselves well beyond our lives into the future. Right when we prepare this next the generation. generation. Right. That's right. Okay. Well, that's, that's great <laughs> advice for us all. And something that uh, I hope we play this interview to future people at Ashesi as well, future yes. managers at Ashesi, and just all keep re remembering why we're here. Absolutely. And thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for your leadership. Thank you for dreaming big. Thank you for having us as a part. Well, thank you, Rita. And when you're starting something, or even as you're doing, going day by day, there's always this concern about what can I really do? Mm. And if you're going alone, it's scarier. If you have partners, it's, it's easier. Mm. And what the foundation has done for us is been, yourself been a, a fantastic partner but also encouraging us um, to, to really see what the, the value of partnership is. And it's, it's helped us. Ashesi is really transformed. We are now an institution mm. that is partnering with other p universities across mm. the continent. We're sharing what we're doing with others. We're learning from others. And we're really collaborating in a way that we wouldn't have done, certainly in this stage of our history, if we didn't have this partnership with the MasterCard Foundation. So I want to thank you for that as well. Is you're not only uh, focused on individual students, but you're also sort of thinking about the big picture and you're encouraging us all to dream bigger and do bigger things. And I think that's very powerful. If we keep that up, we will transform this continent. Patrick, I, I also have to thank you. Um, I don't know if it's even possible to describe how this partnership has transformed us and given us permission to also dream big and to do bold things and hard things. Um, in many ways, so much of what we've learned together along this journey is now playing out in other parts of the life of the foundation and how we work with others. It's what gave us courage to say that you know, we can just focus, this, certainly for this next decade, on young people and to help them realize their dreams, create better lives for themselves and for others. Uh, in many ways, this partnership gave us permission and gave us encouragement that we were on the right path and to keep going and to keep moving. So I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. And we look forward to even more partnership, even more. E even more, and even more big things ahead of us. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.